Welcome everybody. My name is Mikey Mhenna and our special guest for this Africa conversation is Hiba Hajfelder, who has over 20 years of experience in development and institutional capacity building. Her work experience between 1996 and 2006 covered community development initiatives, production of knowledge resources, as well as ecotourism. She's worked with a diverse local and international organizations such as the Search for Common Ground in Washington DC and in Jordan, Save the Children, in Lebanon, Arab Resource Collective in Lebanon, UNOPS in Geneva, supporting a peace building uh, program in Rwanda, as well as being the co-founder of the volunteer coordinator and volunteer coordinator of uh, MADA, a local NGO in Lebanon. She is fond of discovering diverse artistic works from the region and internationally, and personally enjoys writing and visual storytelling. And in uh, context of this conversation leads the Arab Image Foundation. So Hiba, thank you so much for joining Africa Conversations. Thank you, Mikey, and thanks everyone for joining. <laughs> Absolutely, it's our pleasure to have you here. So you. I wanted to ask you uh, a sort of biographical question to start. I read your bio, you've done a lot of different things. So what, give us some sort of context of what in your career led you to the point where you thought, I really want to dedicate my time to um, an organization as unique as the Arab Image Foundation. Mm, thank you. Um, I think if I, if I look back to my teens and in school, you know, the famous question everyone asks is, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I think at the age of 13, none of us really know what is out there and what is it that we want to do with a lot of the interests that we have. Um, but I remember telling my teacher at the time that I, I, I wish to be a cultural ambassador. I didn't know what an ambassador does and I, and I um, at the time, but I knew that my interest in, in theater, in, in music, in photography, even at that time was, was quite high. And in the course of the things that I learned at university and throughout my work experience, I was always passionate about the image uh, and how we tell stories through, through the image. Even when I'm watching a live performance, I'm very much uh, seeing and capturing a scene or, or um, identifying a certain notion of what actors are on stage doing. Um, and in the last 15 to 20 years, the fact that I've always, um, I've, I've worked in different places and I've been really driven by the, the diversity of people that I've seen, but also the landscapes, and it's always colored my, my, uh, my work experience. And when I worked with the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation for about 10 years, I made the shift in 2016. Uh, that, that for me was a milestone where I said, I want to be more in the cultural sector. It's, it's a sector that interests me and I want to bring in what I've learned in community development, working across different disciplines into this sector. Um, and so before joining the Arab Image Foundation, I was with Afaq and I had the privilege of seeing so many artists and practitioners in different fields and looking at their work. Um, and then I decided to take two years off actually, but was approached by the Arab Image Foundation and I don't regret it for a minute. It was something of a, of a beautiful moment. And I want to tell a funny story because 23 years ago, when I was in an apartment setting up Mada with a collective, the three members who were working at the Arab Image Foundation were in that same apartment. And I would look across the room and say to my colleague, what do these people do all day wearing white gloves and hovering <laughs> over one image? <laughs> and it, it was just such a revelation that 23 or 25 years later, actually, I end up, um, you know, leading this organization, I don't like the word leading, but working with a group of people that are so passionate about um, photographic practices and about the image and about how we protect, but also how we open up this beautiful um, collection and archive to others. And so I think fate has come around and I'm yeah. back to the place 
where I should be. So the, the natural next question is, where are these white gloves? Um, <laughs> you see them everywhere when yeah. you walk into the office, yeah. <laughs> so the Arab Image Foundation is one of those organizations that at first listen, or at well, the first time you hear about it, it's not entirely obvious what, what kind of foundation this is. Um, is it a foundation dedicated to preserving the way people imagine Arabs? Is it a is it a photography agency? What is this place, right? Is it? And so what I did was I typed into Google Images Arab Image Foundation, and I wanted to see what come came up. And it's <laughs> I wanted to see how the most ubiquitous parts of um, or the most prevalent images related to the name Arab Image Foundation, how that may lead to misunderstanding about what this organization actually does. So yes. if you can, let I want you to just clear it up in just two minutes. Imagine you're speaking to a 15 year old. What does the Arab Image Foundation do? Um, usually when I, when I mention Arab Image Foundation, I always add the caveat that Arab is not in relation to the ethnicity. It's about capturing a geographic area and its richness and diversity. So it's more the Arabic speaking region, if you wish. And, and even the boundaries are fluid. This foundation was set up by a group of artists who were passionate about, about image, about the practices in the region. And it was their drive to go out there and search for the vernacular, not the classical stuff that you know, a news agency would have or a photographic agency would have, but more the family albums, the images that we see in, in daily life. And so it was, it was the, the passion of, of these three founding members, but also the context in which they found themselves in a country in Beirut, where there was little support for any structure that would protect and uh, collect and study research and expose those images to a wider public. And so what started out as a drive uh, and to research the, 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 the photographic uh, collections from the region after 25 years today, we're in a place where we are custodians to about 306 collections, making up 500,000 photographic objects that we care for, we house, we protect, but we also preserve in, by way of digitizing so that we can share those eventually online and have researchers and artist-led projects tell us stories about these images, not only what we have identified. Um, and so I think the, the, the mission of the foundation is really this, it's not to be the only organization that carries this photographic heritage from this region, but an organization that through the image talks to the realities and provokes topics that are of concern to us, whether they're social, political, or justice related, but also looking at the photographic practices in terms of what is different here? Do we have a history in the way we take photographs and the way photo studios have been formed that is different from other parts of, of, of the world? And what is that story? So if you think about what that story is, um, can you give me a sense of how the collections have evolved and how the, you know, how does the public actually engage with the work of AIF? What does, what does that relationship actually look like? And mm -hmm. how has the organization changed since that small artist collective uh, started the organization? Mm -hmm. when, when, when it was first set up as a, as a structure, as an association, um, the, the, the interest was really for these individuals to work on their projects. And so it was, it was like a, a small working group, if you wish, that was doing their own research and visiting Jordan and Palestine and, and Morocco and, and trying to engage with these communities and see what kind of collections exist. And so with time, 
that intense research and collecting practice metamorphosed into something that was a combination of people going out and seeking collections and adding and enriching what already exists. But it slowed down because at the end of the day, we're not a bank and there's a limited capacity to what we can hold. And so at the moment, we have a lot of pending collections that need to be cared for and digitized and, and researched. But also, um, we're always open when people come to us and say, listen, we have this incredible collection made up of glass plates, for instance, which is the most precious form of format, if you wish, because it, it normally it's over 100 years old. Um, or people who come to us and say, I'm looking at the queer history of this region. I mean, how many of us know of archives that carry any kind of uh, visual storytelling about the queer community. Um, and so it's it's by sometimes it's the nature of the topic. It's how marginalized a community is or whether it has a platform to expose its own stories. But it's the combination of collections that the members have sought and that people have come to us with that make the richness. And, and so you'll see not only a variety of formats, glass plates and, and prints and negatives, um, but also in terms of what they represent. As I said, most of them are family albums. There are photo studio mm. collections. Uh, um, and then you have the, the more vernacular. Um, and here what you see, for instance, and I'd like to touch on this, is this aspect of we're not hell bent on fixing anything. So what, the way we receive an image, we remain faithful to the way it, it, we received it without needing to beautify, conserve, but rather to protect, to make sure that it's not going to deteriorate further. And so here you see an image which, which shows a lot of deterioration. And what we do is we try and, and maintain its status. And by digitizing, we make sure that when the lifespan of this material ends, at least the image is kept uh, somewhere yeah. in the form of a digital copy. Let me ask you some questions about um, the size of the collection and the sort of geographic and um, um, the sort of uh, timeline of the of the um, of the collection. So, give me a sense of where all these images are from. Are they primarily from Lebanon? Um, are they primarily from the last, you know, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 100 years? Um, where, where are they? What's in this collection? Maybe that's the easiest way of asking it. Yeah. Um, the, the, um, probably the oldest uh, object that we have dates back to 1860. And um, the collection comes from different countries. So it started more in the, you know, in, in the neighborhood. So it was Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Palestine, Egypt, Morocco. Um, but, but, but also at the heart of the foundation was always this question of having more porous boundaries. And so looking at the diaspora communities, whether it was in Latin America or Africa, oh, this particular image is very interesting because it shows a whale on the Mediterranean coast. Uh, and there's a whole story behind it, but I will not say more because it will, we will talk about it later on. Um, and so they, we, we also include the diaspora communities uh, because as you know, a lot of, a lot of community, and I myself, I'm from a diaspora community having been born in, in Ghana. And I know how attached people are, not only to images they bring to the country that they're migrating to, but the kind of, images that are built in time in, in, in albums and, and negatives from the place where they're living. And so the richness of the stories extends beyond what is perceived as national boundaries. And in a way, it goes back and forth. It's about a past which has also seen this region evolve and sometimes to disastrous ends because of um, geographic and political considerations, but where the stories remain and they remain and they cross borders. And so the collections come from across this region, including for instance, a collection from Iran, 
So we're not closed off, but we're saying this is the geography that we want to explore. And these are the communities, no matter where they are, that we want to get their stories and, and their, their visual collections. Yeah. I want to ask you uh, something about a, a exchange that you and I had like about a month ago when we decided, okay, we're going to do this interview. Um, so for those who don't know, all these slides we prepare, right? Um, this, this is the work that Afikita does to prepare for the interviews. And there is something on these slides that are not usually on the slides, which is captions. Um, <laughs> and I remember in preparation, you said, Mikey, you can't crop these images. <laughs> you can't crop these images. You can't just fit them however you want to fit them. And there needs to be captions. And it needs to say the precise caption and courtesy of Arab Image Foundation it needs to be, there are standards. There are things yeah. that you need to um, abide by. Um, yeah. And these are objects. These are not just images that are croppable, right? So let yeah. me ask you, what are the, your biggest pet peeves that people <laughs> like me violate <laughs> constantly on the internet where there are no rules? Yeah, I thanks for pointing that out, because I think a lot of the frustration is is mutual. On the one hand, if you come to me and you say, listen, I need this image by tomorrow. I have a news piece that I'm putting out. Of course, you're in, you're under pressure and you're in a rush. And I would like to provide you with something that visualizes your story. On the other hand, what most people don't know is the incredible care that we take in how we give access to images. Because at the back of every image, and this is Al Kawalis, so it's the backstage, is who's the photographer? Who's the collector? Who's the copyright owner? Um, how can we, with the, with the information that we have at hand, make sure that we provide the person viewing the image with as much information as possible, both in respect of the rights, but also to give credit to those who research, who photograph and who collect an image. In the previous image that you showed, for instance, Mohsen Yamin is a collector who throughout the war was trying to save photographic collections um, in North Lebanon. And it's thanks to him that we have exactly this image that was taken by Maril Khazan, one of the first woman photographers from Lebanon. Um, people would call her an amateur uh, photographer because she didn't have a photo studio. But thanks to her collections uh, and to her, to her incredibly beautiful array of images, we have a taste of the society and the history and the time in North Lebanon that we wouldn't have otherwise. So you have the photographer, you have the collector, and then you have our foundation, which is trying to both credit these people, but also provide access to other researchers and artists who are intrigued by these images. In this case, this is a superimposed image, if you can see. Uh, and so the captions for us is a way of showing respect and, and caring for what is behind the image. And so when a news reporter gets angry with us because we don't provide them with you know, the three images they need for their, um, their A4 article, all I can say is um, please try to understand that the kind of work we do is, is also about um, owing up to our role as custodians uh, and what that means in terms of um, ethical considerations sometimes in, in what we expose online, but also the whole issues around access and rights and copyright. So uh, related to that, how do you expect the work of the foundation is going to change when mo the 99.9999999% of images um, taken today are not objects? There are ones mm -hmm. and zeros. They exist entirely digitally. Um, how do you expect the, the work um, of the foundation will evolve in 50 years, um, in 100 years? It's, it's um, you know, there were two talks that we moderated ourselves because that's also of interest to us to talk to practitioners around us because we don't hold all the experience and all the knowledge around uh, um, photography. Um, 
And in conversation with Agop Kandashian and then Tare Amrad, Agop being a, a wonderful analog photographer, and Tare Amrad, who's who heads the Beirut uh, printmaking studio, they are both passionate of uh, analog photography, which they claim is the only photography. And I think there is always going to be this strife between people who can see what the future may hold in terms of us losing the object of the, you know, the, the, the image to the, to the binary zeros and ones. And then you have this community of passionate photographers who will hold on with their teeth to this metier and to the art of, you know, um, um, using the dark room and um, advocating for why the material aspect of the image is as beautiful and as important as the image itself. And so I think we will be overrun by what technology has to offer, but I think there is nothing that replaces the smell, the feel, and the, um, the richness of paper and holding something in your hands or capturing an image uh, and taking it to, uh, to have it developed. Uh, in the last issue of the newsletter, for instance, when I talk about how we see worlds disappearing, even within our generation, um, I mean, I am of a certain age, but it's not long ago that I used to go to the photo studio in Mruj, which is next to my dad's village, and develop images and, and the, the pleasure of putting a film in a camera and not knowing what's going to come out of the 36 images at the end. I think that pleasure, uh, like things which we've known 40 years ago that have come back like the Polaroid camera, who would have thought that this would come back? And it has. And so I'm, I'm positive that there will be a parallel universe uh, with technological inventions of what is an image and how we see an image. But in parallel, you're always going to have this world and this, this community of lovers uh, of, of analog photography. If you look back at the um, the sort of the early days of of AIF, like um, in 1997, you know, it's it's a, a moment of reconstruction and trying to figure out what what just happened um, and maybe who were we, who are we now, who were we for this the last 20 years, and who were we before 1975 as well. Mm -hmm. um, we're in a similar moment right now. Um, yeah. And so is the sort of mission of the foundation also changing um, and trying to respond to this current moment, um, which looks, I don't know if it looks more like 1973 or if it looks more like 1997, but it looks like something. Um, and it feels mm -hmm. it feels very heavy in Beirut these days. Mm -hmm. So, how is mm -hmm. the uh, the the work of the foundation um, sort of changing and responding to that? Mm -hmm. I I think in in terms of of the mission, um, it stands the test of time because we are about a community of um, practitioners, and we're an association that tries to also share the kind of work that is involved in, in, in what I call the crafts of this organization, when we care for images, when we digitize them, when we document them. Um, and so I think this will stand the test of time. But at the same time, we are a product of our context and we need to be attentive to the kind of topics and the type of malaise that we live in. And images are a wonderful source of material to provoke us and, and to question. Um, and 1975 is not only about the war, it's also about what was society like at that time the kind of power dynamics that existed and that continue to this day. So some things may have changed if you look at reconstruction projects and massive money that gets poured into a context after the war, which was the case in the 90s and when the foundation was constructed. But it's also about seeing what hasn't changed and, and which is sad. Looking at, uh, and I mean, in America, they talk about 
race issues. Well, we are also a society that needs to be very critical about how we look at people from different backgrounds and different economic classes. And so there are topics that continue to haunt us no matter what period we're in. And the image lends itself to this kind of reflection and looking back and seeing what is it that this microcosm of an album or of a set of negatives can tell us about how society is today and what has changed and what needs to be tackled, what needs to be provoked. I'm thinking of, for instance, um, we're working currently on, the, on, a, on a beautiful collection, which is the, uh, from the Photo Jacques studio. Uh, and Agop Kuyumjian and two other photographers have, have taken what we call uh, photo surprise, uh, capturing people on the streets and a way of enticing them back to the photo studio so that they can develop pictures and, and sell it to them. And what these photographers don't recognize is that 70 and 80 years later, we're looking at these images, which not only show people, but the entire landscape of Tripoli as a city and how people used to dress and, and what did the streets look like. And so these are incredible gems that um, in that era and looking today can give us insight and that should always put us in a place where we question even our own practices. Another example, you know, is, is you know, the, the whole notion of what should be kept at the foundation? Should we keep the physical objects or should those stay in their so-called natural home if it's a a family house or a photo studio, uh, what should stop us from uh, helping people preserve their own collections, but then having digital rights to give others access without us hoarding this physical object? And these are all questions that with, within the 25 years have come up. And so we're, we need to constantly challenge our own practices and question what is it that we're doing so that it also reflects the values of the foundation, which is about inclusion, which is about dealing with justice issues. And it's not only about the image and the publication about a photographer, but much more about the context around these practices. Yeah. Speaking of context, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, uh, the August 4th blast in Beirut and the Right now, I have on the screen a picture of a beautiful space um, that mm -hmm. was taken in 2018. Um, and like every other space in Beirut, and in particular in Jemezi, where the office is, um, you were deeply, deeply affected. So I'd love to know exactly um, how the, the sort of the team and the organization is trying to uh, respond and react and rebuild um, and sustain after such a devastating, um, a devastating experience. Yeah, I think, like you said, uh, Mikey, the, it's not only the Arab Image Foundation, it's the entire fabric of the city that was shaken, literally. Uh, and we were we are 800 meters bird's view from the port. So you can imagine the, sh the shock waves and the, the damage. And as you can see in, in these images, the office was in shambles. Luckily, one of our team member was, uh, was there and was slightly wounded, but it could have been a lot more serious. Um, and I think the, 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 the first instinct is, you know, is, this, is the team safe? And also, is the collection safe? Uh, and so it was what is surprising, and people always say, so what was destroyed during the, you know, after the blast? And luckily, because of the way we practice preservation and because of the emergency preparedness plan that we followed since 2014, the cool storage room, as well as the pending uh, collection space is kept in such a way that every object is delicately housed in envelopes and boxes that had shielded the object itself from the blast. So even when you had the roof toppling over and the box boxes being shaken, and in one of the images you can see in the cool storage room, the boxes were literally on top of each other. None 
of the 500,000 objects were damaged. We had three objects that were part of a cadre, a frame, and there were frizzers on the glass, but not on the image itself. And um, part of our collection uh, are precious glass plates, which are extremely delicate. And as I mentioned earlier, very rare. None of them were harmed. And, and I think this was a lesson for us to really take care when we have um, film archives and photographic archives and music archives, how delicate, but also how important it is to make sure that their habitat and their, their, uh, their ecosystem is safe enough to withstand any kind of risk. And we cannot foretell what the risks are. And we live in a country that is constantly surprising us with disasters. Um, and it took almost three months to or four to do the, the basic repairs so that we have a normal working um, conditions to be able to resume our work. And we were very active. And I think what sustained the team mentally was this affinity and, and this, you know, knowing that, you know, you wake up in the morning and you're going to a job that you like, even with all the mental breakdown that people experienced after the explosion. Um, and one of the hardest thing is, was, you know, how do you carry on operations and trying to take care of the well-being of the team? Um, but I but I work with a group of fantastic people and I'm really thrilled that we managed to pull this through. Um, and I joined on the 1st of September, just to note. So I, I met the team on the, on the 1st of August, wow. literally four days before the blast went off. And I was supposed to officially start on the 1st of September. Oh so you God. can imagine the kind of marathon that was going on even in August. But we managed to put it back in place, um, but it's not our permanent home. We are looking to relocate to make sure that we can expand and better protect our physical and digital collections and to be able to share potentially a space with other cultural institutions. Because what the BLAST also taught us is that it's so hard for each entity and it, we're talking about independent cultural organizations to stand on their feet again. Um, and how much can we share in terms of resources, in terms of mental power to keep ourselves going? Forget mental power, just power. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just power, yeah. power. We need some yeah. power, power. Yeah. Um, this is a perfect segue to my next question, um, which is related to the fact that AIF is still in Beirut, um, which is not a um, is not a small thing. Mm -hmm. What are the what are the the core challenges that you and the rest of the team are adamantly and um, stubbornly facing in the in your commitment to keeping AIF in Beirut? Um, and what do foreign supporters just not seem to understand about why it's important to keep uh, the Arab Image Foundation in Beirut? Mm. I think the, the, the challenges are, I mean, they affect families, like they affect institutions, like they affect schools and hospitals. I think the calamity of what we're going through is nationwide and it cuts deep across any discipline you can think of. It's about our daily bread, basically. I mean, having to make sure you have your uh, tap water running, that you have electricity. Um, these things, we shouldn't be working up, you know, against, these things should be the basics. And anyone outside of this context it's hard for them to fathom, but I must say that there's been incredible show of solidarity, both by our partners, our donors, people who've known the foundation. And I think this is also thanks to the collective effort within the cultural sector to make that message loud and clear and to explain that we, we are not, not short of ideas not a single day. We're not short of initiatives that we want to start and kickstart. We have programs that we want to put in place, but we spend 60% of our time struggling to make sure that we have internet and that we can 
um, you know, provide the climate control that our collection needs. And that's why, for instance, a year ago, we said we need to invest in solar energy, which we did. And I think we're probably one of the first cultural institutions to have done that because you're constantly in a state of mind that needs to be faster than the disaster that's coming. And we could see that a blackout, blackout was very probable and, and we're living it. And so the being in Beirut is not so much a statement as it is, this is where we are, where are we going to go? And one has to make with this difficult context. And in, in, in light of a foundation like other independent uh, associations, we we struggle with financial transactions, the very um, you know uh, funding that that keeps us alive in terms of operations and projects. We struggle with the pandemic and the implications this has on what we would want to do in terms of public programming, but also for the safety of the team and others around us. We struggle with a country that's falling apart and not and us not knowing where it's going, but at the same time, relying on this historical knowledge that we all have, that this small country has survived always because of private initiatives. And, and this is not necessarily a very positive thing because it puts a lot of pressure on a few shoulders and on a sector, the cultural sector, sector which, is, which is probably the first to fall because when you, when you have politics interfering and an economic context it's very hard to keep practitioners in the country and we're seeing you know loads of people migrating and leaving the country then it it calls for a very stubborn uh, attitude to say that okay we can't solve everything in the city but we have something we care about and we need to make sure that it stands the question is how do we do it together and as a foundation or as a collective, it's impossible to do things on our own, which is why um, over the last two years, we've seen incredible shows of solidarity. And the solidarity has to start locally before we can mobilize uh, internationally and ask others to understand our context. Very, very well said. Um, the last question I'll ask you about is um, persistent misunderstandings um, of the sort of where AIF is going um, and where you hope it, you know, the role that you hope AIF is going to play in Lebanon and also regionally. Mm. Um, you know, um, last year in, in preparation for this year, which is our 25th anniversary, we embarked on a series of reflections with people who've passed through AIF, whether they're team members or general assembly members or people who, who've done different projects, and to try and get a sense of a, a capture in time of the association from its inception to this day. And so we looked at different things that the Arab Image Foundation does, including collecting practices and research practices, artist-led projects, mm -hmm. but also the crafts, you know? What was preservation like in 1997? What's changed today? How did digitization change how the foundation works? And I'm always of the, of the I'm always thinking it's, it's interesting because we, we can't necessarily judge how the foundation worked or operated or functioned or correct misconceptions of people towards the foundation because they are perceptions after all. Um, you know, I hear a lot of stories, people say, mm, I've always thought of it as a very closed group and that you're not open to people from the outside. And maybe at the time this was the case because of how the people who were in the foundation saw this association's work. And I think the, the, the interesting bit is to look at that story and to take, the, the, to take um, lessons and see how is it the community we intend to serve and work with see us so that we can represent also the aspirations of artists, of researchers, and not so much as a closed group of people who are passionate about image practices. And so I think in the next five years, for instance, 
what we aspire to do is build on the good practices that have happened in the last 25 years and not shun the challenges, but take them as part of the story and as part of what makes this foundation. Any foundation is made from it, from the people who work in it and who give it life. And so it's normal that you're going to see ebbs and flows. Um, one day you're going to be in tune with what the foundation does. And another time you're going to say, what happened? Um, but in the next five years, if I can just very quickly say, what we're hoping to do more is create more structured opportunities for fellows. So people who want to come and research and add with their rich input or contribution to the stories of our collections, but also offer more residencies for people who want to learn the craft of preservation. Because as you know, of all the universities that exist in this country or in the region for that matter, there's very little specialization and the foundation has experience and has accrued this kind of skills that can be extremely beneficial for, for new fresh graduates, but also for people who are interested in, in the discipline. And what you notice, for instance, in the last year is our um, leaning more towards exposing the collections through different mediums. And so we started Lamha, which is an Arabic podcast of three to four minutes. It's often one of the team members who uh, narrates something about the collection to give an audio dimension to something that you see or to probe and, and raise curiosity. The newsletter itself is a place that collects a lot of the exchanges we do. So like, like what you're doing and this great initiative of Afikra, that you can capture a lot of the people you interview and the kind of knowledge that gets accumulated with all these stories. And so I think that's going to be our pension for the next uh, five years, but definitely to give more room for artist led projects and, and research and hopefully in an expanded uh, premise that allows us to do so. Beautiful. Well, I look forward to that. Um, let's open up to the little quick Q&A and then we'll ask, uh, get a few questions from the audience too. So the first question is, what have you been reading or watching these days? <laughs> oh dear, okay. No, well, no judgment. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I don't have a television since 25 years, but okay. I do watch a lot of live performances. Um, I recently went to a, pay, a play at Masrah Al Madina in Beirut, nice. literally two weeks ago, and I watched I Medea by the, the writer and director uh, Sleiman Al Bassam. Um, I also watch a lot of live performances in Metro Al Madina, so that keeps me very busy, and they range from uh, cabaret shows to Hishik music Bishik. performance, Hishik Bishik, but also Tarab. Um, it, it's it's a it's a framework that that intrigues me. Uh, Amazing. And and I'm I'm a I don't know how to describe it, but I'm a parallel reader. I never read one book at a time, and often I'm drawn to uh, poetry, whether in listening to music or reading uh, someone like Bassam Hajar, who's a great. Uh, and late poet and writer from Lebanon. Um, I also recently, I've been reading a lot of these little beautiful books that Kaifata, which is a publishing house, uh, uh, produces. And it's, it's, they're very short uh, and they fit very much my lifestyle, which is extremely busy. Uh, some of them are in English, some in Arabic. So yeah, it's, I'm, I'm erratic in what Lots I read. Lots of stuff. Hey. Okay. <laughs> um, a couple more questions. I'm going to try to get these a little faster because we have questions in the chat too. Who would you love to shadow for a day past or present? Um, <laughs> uh, I, would, I would love to shadow Muhammad Swaid. Muhammad Swaid is, is a beautiful person and a filmmaker who's very poetic. And I'm very interested in, in his brain and how he conjures up images and the kind of stories he tells, which very much reflect normal human beings uh, and normal daily life, but also the poetry, the sadness, the agony. 
I would love to see him from A to Z putting together a film the way he does. Amazing. Okay, I'm going to skip the third one because I've kind of asked you about it already. So the last one is outside of your profession, whose work inspires you? Oh, <laughs> um, hmm. that's a that's a difficult one. You know, I there, there's not it's not so much a profession as much as it is people who have been able to make a life and not simply a living. And so I'm always, I find, I find people who've adopted minimalist ways of living, whether in nature, in, in farming, or with, with the way they carry themselves to be extremely intriguing. Uh, and, and it inspires me. And I think because it's, it's what I lack at the moment. Uh, my life is quite busy between home and the foundation and moving between Beirut and Bern. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could, I could also say in the realm of the, of the photography world, there's a, a collective which is called Collective 220 and they are based in Algeria. And what inspires me is that they've decided to form themselves as a collective and they do incredible photography of different parts of Algeria and they all have a different language in terms of how they take images. But it's, it's also the way they come together as an experimental lab and how they support each other. And I had the pleasure to meet them when I was in Algeria in 2018 during work I was doing with Afaq. And, and, and these, this is a group to closely watch, Collectif de Saint Vin. Okay, amazing. Um, okay, we have four questions in the chat. The first one comes from Marianne. Hi, thank you so hey. much for being here. I just, I, um, I spent a lot of time in the Arab Image Foundation doing a residency in 2016. And um, it was a different artist residency, not there. And I now understand how many images I have used as resources for other work. I'm not a photographer. Would you mind revisiting copyright concerns for artists using your files? Or do you have them? How would you like us to um, reciprocate given all that's happened for you. Thank you, Mary Ann. I mean, if I if I understood your question correctly, um, I mean, the, the thing is, when when people ask us and uh, for certain images, whether it's one or looking at a collection, because we don't really know what we're going to use, we usually provide a template, which is an image request. This is the kind of exchange that allows us both to understand what you or somebody else, an artist or researcher needs so that we can provide it. And usually we provide uh, low resolution images so that people can decide what is what is the end set of images they want to use. And on the basis of what the output is, we can work out a way of providing you with high resolution images. Uh, we could, and it allows us also to go back and check our legal contracts with the depositors, with the donors of the images, because copyright, it is not there to stall uh, access. It's there to protect artists. It's there to protect intellectual uh, property. And, and when it's seen in this light, I think we all have a stake in reciprocating and making sure that when we use an image uh, or a document that we ask um, if we know where it's coming from or who holds it, you know, how can we use it and what is the best way? And that, that, um, the place to find that is on the website. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. And you can write to hello at uh, and, and ask for, for certain um, image use. And, and, and again, this is also a misunderstanding about the foundation. We're not trying to hoard. We're trying to make sure that we provide access where we can, but that we also respect rights and, and make sure that it's a community of care for both cool. those who create an image or uh, care for an image, but also those who need to use it. Okay, great. Okay, we have Linda up next. Uh, hi, Eva. Nice to hear you talk. Hi, uh, Linda. <laughs> uh, 
I just wanted to say that I think the Arab Image Foundation is the fant a fantastic institution. My um, concern or interest is to have the images out there at exhibitions. And I wonder, I mean, you don't even have to answer this, but uh, you know, just to think about how that would happen, where you could do it. I think it's great um, for all of us to see these images in real life, not just digitize. So yeah. not really question, but you know. Thank you, Linda. Linda, by the way, is one of our great supporters, and I, I um, I'm so glad you're you're uh, you're in this conversation. Thank you, Linda. Sure. Um, I think your wish is one of uh, so many people, and we've been approached by different kinds of initiatives to do exhibitions and actually we do them all the time it's just that it's not us necessarily curating which was in a period of the foundation's history very much the way things were done but we're constantly solicited um, for for our collections to be exhibited and so for instance if you've heard of Latif Lani, who's a fantastic Iraqi photographer who passed away in November of last year um, even before he passed away, there were many requests to project his collection, which is in the custody of, of the foundation. And so you will see in the next year, uh, three, if not four exhibitions. And actually there's one as we speak in Al Ala in Saudi Arabia on uh, Latif Al Um And, and the, 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 the struggle is how, ma how many can we do in terms of exhibitions alongside everything else that we need to work on, uh, whether it's publications or whether it's accompanying researchers who require images for their dissertation or their publications or artist-led projects, uh, like somebody, uh, um, not to say names, but two artists who are using the collections in live performances. And so the requests are many, and it's important for us to somehow maintain a line of what it is that we care about thematically, and then invite people in to project these images so that more people can enjoy them and look at them. We have two questions we, left. Hey, um, yeah. I'm gonna, Hiba, I'm gonna cut you off because we have two sure. questions left and they're both really, really good. So I'm gonna try to get both of them. And so Dalia, you're up next. Hi, Heba, and hi, hi Maki. Hi, Dalia. Uh, I'm Dalia Heba. Um, so nice I'm a, uh, nice to meet you. I'm a photographer based in Brooklyn and New York. And, you know, I've been following the work of the Arab Image Foundation. Uh, I don't remember from when, but obviously the work that you guys do is very, very important. Is there a way that people like us can get involved? I'm Lebanese, but I live here. Is there a way we can get involved or help? In, in something because again this work is so important and Lebanon is just so far away so thank you Dalia thanks for the sh show of solidarity and wanting to engage uh, and there are many ways I think if if you wish for instance to donate to the foundation that's definitely always welcome if you wish to be um, depending on what your profession is, if you want to be engaged in, in doing research on the collection, we often invite people to go in and see and, and probe and, and if they have project grants that focuses on photographic uh, practices or on a certain theme where the image can lend itself to that, um, we're, we're very open. What hasn't helped us a lot is the better version of the online platform, which we're revamping, and which hopefully would allow people like you, Dalia, and others to have more interactive and more interface with the collections. Um, but write us, write to us, and, and tell us what it is that you, you think you can do or engage in, and we'd be happy to exchange with you. Amazing. Okay, the last question comes from Joanne. Um, Joanne, take us away. Hi, thank you. Thank you. I've, um, I remembered when the Arab Image Foundation actually started, I had friends who were in, I'm from Australia, of Lebanese background, so it's great to see it evolve like this. Um, I'm currently teaching at a secondary school in Beirut, and I teach photography, being a photographer myself. So I'm really interested in how, do you have any initiatives to engage young people under the age of 18 
particularly because they live in, um, they have no idea about and concept of, you know, analog photography. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Joan. It's it's uh, it's one of those things which are high on our aspiration list. Um, and when we say we can't take on everything, it doesn't mean that people who have the ideas cannot reach out to us to see what kind of collaboration can be put in place. And so I would invite you, if you have a concept in mind that you think we can engage on, we're ready to have this conversation. And I'll give an example. Somebody from the Antonin University last year called me in to give a talk to a group of students, um, first year students in, in, I think it was um, in design and some other department. And what we did with them was I invited them to then look at the collection and write stories about them using graphic novel techniques or uh, drawings or creating stories. And this was a wonderful way to interact with this particular age group. Or for instance, the example I usually give is Samandal, who, who do this fantastic publication that comes out in the form of uh, cartoons and graphic uh, novels and the issue number 14, for instance, was all about the collections at the Arab Image Foundation, and it was reflected in the work of five to six different artists. And so ideas are welcome. We can't always do everything, but the idea is when we have a, a bigger space, which is what we're working towards, we want to explore more these uh, opportunities to work with school children, with universities, and not only in Lebanon, but to allow our online platform be the platform that people in Australia or in Brooklyn or in Senegal uh, can access and interact with us. Amazing. Um, Hiba, thanks for sharing your perspective with us. This was a huge pleasure um, for us and a thrill for us. I've been wanting to interview you for some time and I love the Arab Image Foundation. So I'm, I'm uh, really, really happy to get to know it from the inside. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. And thanks, everyone, for listening in. And um, do call on us. I put in the chat a number of links that you can look at. And if you, if you want to follow our monthly stories, please subscribe um, and stay in touch. Thank you, Mikey, for this Absolutely. opportunity. Thank Indeed. you. So this will go up on the website um, tomorrow, up on the podcast, on YouTube. If you don't already subscribe to our YouTube and our podcast, please do so. It takes a second. Um, we are done for the week. We have an event on uh, an event, a live event in Dubai this weekend. Um, and then next week we'll be back for more. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. Shukran. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Afikra. <laughs>